Marxism and the Oppression of Women Section The Reproduction of Labor Power The argument in these pages has taken the form of a critical reading of certain socialist texts pertaining to women's oppression and women's liberation. It is time to sum up the results. Marx, Engels, and their immediate followers contributed more to understanding the oppression of women than participants in the modern women's movement usually recognize. At the same time, the socialist tradition's approach to those issues, presumed to make up the so-called woman question, has been not only incomplete but seriously flawed. In the absence of any stable analytical framework, socialists have had to rely for theoretical guidance on a potpourri of notions drawn from various sources. This hundred-year legacy of ambiguity still hampers work on the question of women, although recent developments suggest that the conditions now exist for resolving it both in theory and in practice. Women today take an increasingly active role in revolutionary change around the world, thereby forcing socialist movements to acknowledge and facilitate their participation. Against this background, recent advances made by socialist feminist theorists have a critical importance. They reflect a new impetus to develop an adequate theoretical foundation for socialist work on women. And they move beyond many of the weaknesses inherited from the socialist tradition. Thus, objectively speaking, the concerns of socialists within the modern women's movement and of revolutionaries within the socialist movement have converged. The relationship of women's struggles to social transformation, a question that is simultaneously practical and theoretical, once again appears as a pressing matter on the revolutionary agenda. In the theoretical sphere, the first requirement for further forward motion is to abandon the idea that the so-called woman question represents an adequate category of analysis. Despite its long history as a serious issue for socialists, the term turns out to have no coherent meaning as a theoretical concept. The various notions associated with it actually conceal, as socialist feminists have pointed out, a theoretical problem of fundamental significance, the reproduction of labor power in the context of overall social reproduction. Socialist theorists have never sufficiently confronted this problem, yet the rudiments of a usable approach lie buried just below the surface of Marx's analysis of social reproduction and capital. The discussion in this and the following chapter suggests a theoretical framework that can situate the phenomenon of women's oppression in terms of social reproduction. Given the weak tradition of theoretical work on the question of women, some words of caution are in order. Theory is, of course, critical to the development of specific analyses of women's situation. Explicitly or implicitly, empirical phenomena must be organized in terms of a theoretical construct in order to be grasped conceptually. At the same time, theory is, by its very nature, severely limited. As a structure of concepts, a theoretical framework simply provides guidance for the understanding of actual societies, past and present. However indispensable this theoretical guidance may be, specific strategies, programs, or tactics for change cannot be deduced directly from theory. Nor can the phenomenon of variation in women's situation over time, and in different societies, be addressed solely by means of theory. These are matters for concrete analysis and historical investigation. By contrast, the argument in these chapters is largely theoretical, and it is therefore necessarily abstract. No attempt is made to develop detailed analyses of women's oppression in, for example, contemporary capitalist society. Such studies and the political conclusions and tasks they imply will be undertaken elsewhere. The phenomenon of women's oppression is a highly individual and subjective experience, often dissected in elaborate descriptive terms, with emphasis on issues of sexuality, interpersonal relations, and ideology. As Michelle Barrett observes, quote, The women's liberation movement has laid great stress on the experiential aspects of oppression in marriage, in sexual relationships, and in the ideology of femininity and male dominance. In the establishment of, quote, sexual politics as a central area of struggle, it has succeeded in drawing back the veil on privatized relationships. This politicization of personal life is a major achievement of feminist activity and one from which Marxism has learned a great deal. End quote. Barrett argues that such analyses are not enough, however, for they have, quote, 
tended to ignore the ways in which private oppression is related to the broader questions of relations of production and the class structure, end quote. In the following pages, the focus is on this latter question, in particular, on the economic or material aspect of women's situation. However restricted the approach may seem from the point of view of the desire for a full-blown exposition of women's oppression, it is necessary to establish these material foundations. Once laid, they will form the indispensable basis for further work. In sum, the starting point in these chapters is a theoretical perspective on social reproduction, but the ultimate goal is to confront the twin problems of women's oppression and the conditions for women's liberation. Footnote. I would like to thank Ira Gerstein for his many perceptive comments on the theoretical arguments in this and the following chapter. End footnote. To situate women's oppression in terms of social reproduction and the reproduction of labor power, several concepts need to be specified, beginning with the concept of labor power itself. Marx defines labor power as something latent in all persons. Quote, by labor power or capacity for labor, is to be understood the aggregate of those mental and physical capabilities existing in a human being, which he exercises whenever he produces a use value of any description. End quote. A use value is a useful thing, something that, quote, by its properties satisfies human wants of some sort or another. End quote. Use values and the useful labor that may go into their production exist in every society, although the precise social form they take varies. Quote, so far, as labor is a creator of use value, is useful labor, it is a necessary condition, independent of all forms of society, for the existence of the human race. End quote. Labor power, which is simply the capacity for useful labor, is therefore also, quote, independent of every social phase of human existence, or rather, is common to every such phase. End quote. Labor power is a latent capacity born by a human being. Its potentiality is realized when labor power is put to use, consumed, in a labor process. Once having entered the labor process, the bearer of labor power contributes labor, for, quote, labor power in use is labor itself. Labor power must, therefore, be distinguished from the bodily and social existence of its bearer. Labor processes do not exist in isolation. They are inserted in determinate modes of production. Furthermore, any production is, at one and the same time, reproduction. Quote, A society can no more cease to produce than it can cease to consume. When viewed, therefore, as a connected whole, and as flowing on with incessant renewal, every social process of production is, at the same time, a process of reproduction. End quote. Social reproduction entails, finally, the reproduction of the conditions of production. For example, in feudal society, quote, quote, the product of the serf must suffice to reproduce his conditions of labor, in addition to his subsistence, end quote. This is a, quote, circumstance which remains the same under all modes of production, for it is not the result of their specific form, but a natural requisite of all continuous and reproductive labor in general of any continuing production, which is always simultaneously reproduction, including the reproduction of its own operating conditions. End quote. Among other things, social reproduction requires that a supply of labor power always be available to set the labor process in motion. The bearers of labor power are, however, mortal. Those who work suffer wear and tear. Some are too young to participate in the labor process, others are too old. Eventually, every individual dies. Some process that meets the ongoing personal needs of the bearers of labor power as human individuals is therefore a condition of social reproduction, as is some process that replaces workers who have died or withdrawn from the active workforce. These processes of maintenance and replacement are often imprecisely, if usefully, conflated under the term reproduction of labor power. Footnote. 
The term reproduction of labor power has also been used in a variety of other ways. It is sometimes employed to designate processes associated with the development of skills and the maintenance of ideological hegemony. For example, the educational system in capitalist society plays an important part in social reproduction and has been analyzed in terms of its role in the so-called reproduction of labor power. Still another use of the term refers to the labor involved in the production and distribution of the means of subsistence. Workers in restaurants and clothing factories in capitalist society are said, for instance, to contribute to the reproduction of labor power. While these various uses of the term reproduction of labor power are suggestive, they disregard the special character of labor that is socially organized into an economy, as opposed to labor that is not. See also the comments in Hindus and Hearst, 1975, Chapter 1. End footnote. Despite the linguistic similarity of the terms production and reproduction, the processes that make up the reproduction of labor power and those that form part of a society's production are not comparable from a theoretical point of view. Reproduction of labor power is a condition of production, for it reposits or replaces the labor power necessary for production. Reproduction of labor power is not, however, itself a form of production. That is, it does not necessarily involve some determinate combination of raw materials and means of production in a labor process whose result is the product of labor power. While some have argued that the reproduction of labor power is a production process taking place in family households, in fact, such activities represent only one possible mode of renewing the bearers of labor power. Labor camps or dormitory facilities can also be used to maintain workers, and the workforce can be replenished through immigration or enslavement, as well as by generational replacement of existing workers. To give preliminary theoretical shape to the problem of the reproduction of labor power, Marx introduced the concept of individual consumption, discussed in Chapter 5. Individual consumption refers to the individual direct producer's consumption of means of subsistence. Marx underscores the difference between individual consumption and productive consumption that takes place in the social labor process. Quote, Such productive consumption is distinguished from individual consumption by this, that the latter uses up products as a means of subsistence for the living individual. The former as means whereby alone, labor, the labor power of the living individual, is enabled to act. The product, therefore, of individual consumption is the consumer himself. The product of productive consumption is a product distinct from the consumer. End quote. As used here, the concept of individual consumption refers essentially to the daily processes that restore the direct producer and enable him or her to return to work. That is, it does not cover generational replacement of existing workers, nor the maintenance of non-laboring individuals, such as the elderly and the sick. Neither does it pertain to the recruitment of new workers into the labor force by, for example, enslavement or immigration. Individual consumption concerns solely the maintenance of an individual direct producer already enmeshed in the production process. It permits the worker to engage again and again in the immediate production process. Footnote. Marx was not at all consistent in his discussion of the concept of individual consumption. At times, he clearly restricts it to the daily maintenance of the individual direct producer. Elsewhere, he slips into formulations that imply it covers the maintenance and renewal of the worker, quote, and his family. Socialist feminists have pointed to these inconsistencies as evidence of the inadequacies of the Marxist tradition. The difficulty lies not only with the remarks, but with any absence of sustained examination of wage labor in the other volumes of Capital, which consider social reproduction as a whole. Had Marx completed his original plan, which projected a separate volume on wage labor, some of the problems might have been rectified. On the plans for Capital, see note 42 of chapter 5. End footnote. The concept of individual consumption refers, then, to the reproduction of labor power at the level of the immediate production process. 
at the level of total social reproduction. It is not the individual direct producer, but the totality of laborers that is maintained and replaced. Footnote. For the question of theoretical levels, see Establet and Gerstein. The wording, quote, total social reproduction, is used here to refer to the theoretical level at which Volume 3 of Capital operates, or in Gerstein's terms, to, quote, the complex unity of production and circulation. End footnote. It is evident that such renewal of the labor force can be accomplished in a variety of ways. In principle, at least, the present set of laborers can be worked to death, and then replaced by an entirely new set. In the more likely case, an existing labor force is replenished both generationally and by new laborers. Children of workers grow up and enter the labor force. Women who had not previously been involved begin to participate in production. Immigrants or slaves from outside a society's boundaries enter its labor force. To the brief extent that Marx considered these questions in general terms, he spoke of laws of population. Quote, Every special historic mode of production has its own special laws of population, historically valid within its limits alone. An abstract law of population exists for plants and animals only, and only insofar as man has not interfered with them. End quote. Moreover, not all present laborers will work in a subsequent production period. Some will become sick, disabled, or too old. Others may be excluded, as when protective legislation is enacted to prohibit child labor or women's night work. In sum, at the level of total social reproduction, the concept of the reproduction of labor power does not in the least imply the reproduction of a bounded unit of population. Footnote. The distinction of theoretical levels makes it clear that the domestic labor debate discussed in Chapter 2 properly concerns the problem of individual consumption at the level of the immediate production process in the capitalist mode of production, and not, as it seemed to some at the time, the reproduction of labor power in general. End footnote. The discussion so far has not required that the gender of direct producers be specified. From a theoretical perspective, it does not yet matter whether they are women or men, so long as they are somehow available to make up the labor force. What raises the question of gender is, of course, the phenomenon of generational replacement of bearers of labor power. That is, the replacement of existing workers by new workers from the next generation. If generational replacement is to happen, biological reproduction must intervene. And here it must be admitted, human beings do not reproduce themselves by parthenogenesis. Women and men are different. The critical theoretical import of the biological distinction between women and men with respect to childbearing appears, then, at the level of total social reproduction. While reproduction of labor power at the level of total social reproduction does not necessarily entail generational replacement, it is at this theoretical level that the issue must be located. Before proceeding further, a popular analytical misconception should be acknowledged. People ordinarily experience the processes of generational replacement in individualized, kin-based contexts, and attempts to develop a theory of the reproduction of labor power often focus on the family unit or household as a starting point. Such a procedure, however understandable, represents a serious confusion with respect to theoretical levels. As commonly understood, the family is a kin-based societal structure, in which take place processes contributing to the worker's daily maintenance, his or her ongoing individual consumption. Families also provide the context in which children are born and grow up, and they frequently include individuals who are not currently participating in the labor force. In most societies, families therefore act as important sites for both maintenance and generational replacement of existing and potential workers. They are not, however, the only places where workers renew themselves on a daily basis. For example, many workers in South Africa live in barracks near their work and are permitted to visit their families in outlying areas once a year. Furthermore, 
children do not necessarily constitute a family's only contribution to the replenishment of society's labor power. Other family members may at times enter the workforce, at harvest, for instance, or during economic crises. Finally, families are not the only source of such replenishment. Other possibilities, as previously mentioned, include migration and enslavement of foreign populations. These observations demonstrate that the identification of the family as the sole site of maintenance of labor power overstates its role at the level of immediate production. Simultaneously, it fetishizes the family at the level of total social reproduction by representing generational replacement as the only source of renewal of society's labor force. In any case, it is premature from a theoretical point of view to introduce a specific social site of the reproduction of labor power, such as the family, into the discussion at this stage. Two further observations should, however, be made concerning the existence of a biological distinction between women and men in the area of childbearing. First, biological differences constitute the material precondition for the social construction of gender differences as well as the direct material factor in the differential position of the sexes in society. Footnote. On the social construction of sex differences, see Barrett, Benaria, Brown, Edholm, Harris, and Young, Molyneux. For a fine critique of this literature, see Sayers. See also the works cited in note 22 of this chapter. End footnote. Second. Sex differences cannot be considered apart from their existence within a definite social system. And nothing more can be said at this point about their significance for the process of the reproduction of labor power. The concepts pertaining to the question of the reproduction of labor power have been developed so far without reference to a specific mode of production. Hence, the discussion has necessarily proceeded at an extreme level of abstraction, or, as Marx puts it, Speaking of the labor process, quote, independently of the particular form it assumes under given social conditions, end quote. Let us move now to a consideration of the reproduction of labor power in class society. The appropriation of surplus labor, or exploitation, constitutes the foundation of class relations. In a class society, the ruling class appropriates the surplus labor performed by an exploited class of direct producers. Marx sums up the essence of class society in an important passage. Beginning of long quote. The specific economic form, in which unpaid surplus labor is pumped out of direct producers, determines the relationship of rulers and ruled, as it grows directly out of production itself and, in turn, reacts upon it as a determining element. Upon this, however, is founded the entire formation of the economic community, which grows up out of the production relations themselves, thereby simultaneously its specific political form. It is always the direct relationship of the owners of the conditions of production to the direct producers, a relation always naturally corresponding to a definite stage in the development of the methods of labor and thereby its social productivity, which reveals the innermost secret, the hidden basis of the entire social structure, and with it the political form of the relation of sovereignty and dependence, in short, the corresponding specific form of the state. End quote. In a class society, the concept of labor power acquires a specific class meaning, Labor power refers to the capacity of a member of the class of direct producers to perform the surplus labor appropriated by the ruling class. In other words, the bearers of labor power make up the exploited class. For a class society, the concept of the reproduction of labor power pertains, strictly speaking, to the maintenance and renewal of the class of bearers of labor power subject to exploitation. While a class society must also develop some process of maintaining and replacing the individuals who make up the ruling class, it cannot be considered part of the reproduction of labor power in society. By definition, labor power in a class society is borne only by members of the class of direct producers. Footnote. 
Socialist feminist discussions of the reproduction of labor power sometimes stretch the term, implicitly if not explicitly, to include the renewal of individuals in the ruling class. In doing so, they produce not only conceptual confusion, they do away with the essential distinction between classes, that between exploiters and exploited. End footnote. Marx contrasts the surplus labor performed by direct producers in a class society to their necessary labor, defining both kinds of labor in terms of the time expended by a single producer during one working day. Necessary labor is that portion of the day's work through which the producer achieves his own reproduction. The remaining portion of the day's work is surplus labor, appropriated by the exploiting class. In reality, a portion of the direct producer's labor may also be devoted to securing the reproduction of other members of the exploited class, where, for example, children, the elderly, or a wife do not themselves enter into surplus production as direct producers. A certain amount of labor time must be expended for their maintenance. Marx was never explicit about what is covered by the concepts of individual consumption and necessary labor. As discussed above, the concept of individual consumption has been restricted here to the direct producer's immediate maintenance. Necessary labor is used, however, to cover all labor performed in the course of the maintenance and renewal of both direct producers and members of the subordinate class not currently working as direct producers. Necessary labor ordinarily includes several constituent processes. In the first place, it provides a certain amount of means of subsistence for individual consumption by direct producers. In a feudal society, for example, direct producers may retain a portion of the total product. In a capitalist society, wages permit the purchase of commodities in the market. In most cases, the raw means of subsistence so acquired do not themselves ensure the maintenance of the laborer. A certain amount of supplementary labor must be performed in order that the necessaries can be consumed in appropriate form. Firewood must be chopped, meals cooked, garden plots tended, clothes repaired, and so forth. In addition to these labor processes facilitating the individual consumption of direct producers, two other sets of labor processes can be identified. A portion of necessary labor goes to provide means of subsistence to maintain members of the exploited classes not currently working as direct producers, the elderly, the sick, a wife. And an important series of labor processes associated with the generational replacement of labor power may also take place, that is, the bearing and raising of the children of the subordinate class. As discussed above, these various aspects of necessary labor have a certain autonomy from a theoretical point of view. Together, they represent an indispensable condition for the reproduction of labor power, and therefore for overall social reproduction. It should be noted that the concept of necessary labor pertains strictly to tasks associated with the reproduction of labor power in the exploited class. Individuals in the ruling class also require daily maintenance, and ordinarily replace themselves through generational reproduction. Such activities do not qualify as necessary labor in Marx's sense, however, for they do not concern the renewal of exploitable labor power. In a given class society, the circumstances and outcomes of the processes of reproduction of labor power are essentially indeterminate or contingent. To maintain otherwise would be to fall into the functionalist argument that a system's needs for labor power must inevitably be fulfilled by the workings of that system. The social relations through which necessary labor is carried out, therefore, cannot be postulated independently of specific historical cases. In particular, the family, however defined, is not a timeless universal of human society. As with any social structure, the form kin-based relationships take always depends on social development and is potentially a terrain of struggle. Footnote. For discussions of functionalism in socialist feminist theory, see Barrett and Sayers. End footnote. Although analytically distinct, necessary labor and surplus labor may lose their specificity and separateness 
when experienced in the real life of concrete labor processes. Several examples suggest the range of possibilities. First, in a feudal society in which serfs pay rent in kind, bringing the lord a share of the product, necessary labor and surplus labor interpenetrate as labor processes. In the case of labor rent, by contrast, in which serfs work the lord's fields independently from their own plot, a clear spatial and temporal demarcation divides surplus labor from necessary labor. In capitalist societies, as we shall see in Chapter 11, a distinction appears between two components of necessary labor, one carried out in conjunction with surplus labor, and the other taking place outside the sphere of surplus labor appropriation. Last, consider the hypothetical example of a slave system that imports laborers from outside its boundaries and forces them to work at a literally killing pace. Under such conditions, generational replacement might become almost impossible, and the amount of necessary labor could be reduced to nearly zero. Of the three aspects of necessary labor, maintenance of direct producers, maintenance of non-laboring members of the subordinate class, and generational replacement processes, only the last requires, in an absolute sense, that there be a sex division of labor, of at least a minimal kind. If children are to be born, it is women who will carry and deliver them. Women belonging to the subordinate class have, therefore, a special role with respect to the generational replacement of labor power. While they may also be direct producers, it is their differential role in the production of labor power that lies at the root of their oppression in class society. This differential role can be situated in theoretical terms. The paragraphs that follow, which elaborate the argument first made by Patty Quick, offer such a theoretical framework as the basis for the analysis of women's oppression. Footnote. In addition to her consideration of women's oppression in class society, Quick develops a contrast between class and non-class societies, arguing that, quote, it is only in class society that the involvement of women in childbearing results in the oppression of women, end quote. Along similar lines, she makes the radical suggestion that, quote, the family is a term applicable only to class societies, in which production and reproduction have a meaning distinct from the organization of production in the interests of society as a whole i.e. communist societies, both primitive and advanced. End footnote. The argument hinges on the relationship of childbearing to the appropriation of surplus labor in class society. Childbearing threatens to diminish the contribution a woman in the subordinate class can make as a direct producer, and as a participant in necessary labor. Pregnancy and lactation involve, at the minimum, several months of somewhat reduced capacity to work. Footnote. For discussions of the relationship between biology, sex divisions of labor, and women's oppression, see Barrett and Sayers. Mark Cousins claims that the biological distinction of sex cannot be addressed by Marxism, for, quote, the capitalist and the laborer are personifications that are abstract to and indifferent to the problem of sexual difference. End quote. By contrast, Marx did not disregard the role of biology in social reproduction. He insisted, for example, that the mortality of direct producers necessitates their maintenance and replacement, thereby making the problem of the reproduction of labor power critical to the social reproduction of class society. In the case of capitalism, quote, reproduction of labor power forms, in fact, an essential of the reproduction of capital itself, end quote. If the biological fact of mortality is central to Marxist analysis, why not the biological fact of sexual dimorphism as well? End footnote. Even when a woman continues to participate in surplus production, Childbearing, therefore, interferes to some extent with the immediate appropriation of surplus labor. Moreover, her labor is ordinarily required for the maintenance of labor power, and pregnancy and lactation may lessen a woman's capacity in this area as well. 
from the ruling class's short-term point of view then. Childbearing potentially entails a costly decline in the mother's capacity to work, while at the same time requiring that she be maintained during a period of diminished contribution. In principle, some of the necessary labor that provides for her during that time might otherwise have formed part of the surplus labor appropriated by the ruling class. That is, necessary labor ordinarily has to increase somewhat to cover her maintenance during the childbearing period, implying a corresponding decrease in surplus labor. At the same time, childbearing is of benefit to the ruling class, for it must occur if the labor force is to be replenished through generational replacement. From the point of view of the dominant class, there is, therefore, a potential contradiction between its immediate need to appropriate surplus labor and its long-term requirement for a class to perform it. The argument outlined in the previous paragraph analyzes the potential implications of an empirical phenomenon, women's capacity to bear children, for the processes of surplus labor appropriation. The discussion operates, it must be emphasized, at the level of theory, and it reveals a contradiction. To resolve the contradiction in an actual society, the dominant class prefers strategies that minimize necessary labor over the long term, while simultaneously ensuring the reproduction of labor power. To what extent it actually succeeds in implementing such strategies is, of course, a matter of class struggle. As one element in the historical resolution of the contradictions, actual arrangements for the reproduction of labor power usually take advantage of relationships between women and men that are based on sexuality and kinship. Other adults, ordinarily the biological father and his kin group, or male kin of the childbearing woman herself, historically have had the responsibility for making sure that the woman is provided for during the period of diminished activity associated with childbearing. Men of the subordinate class thereby acquire a special historical role with respect to the generational replacement of labor power, to ensure that the means of subsistence are provided to the childbearing woman. In principle, women's and men's differential roles in the reproduction of labor power are of finite duration. They come into play only during the woman's actual childbearing months. In reality, the roles take specific historical form in the variety of social structures known as the family. From a theoretical point of view, families in subordinate classes may be conceptualized as kin-based social units within which men have greater responsibility for the provision of means of subsistence to childbearing women during the period of their reduced working contribution. As institutionalized structures in actual class societies, the families of a subordinate class ordinarily become major social sites for the performance of the maintenance as well as the generational replacement aspects of necessary labor. Here, then, is one source for the historical division of labor according to sex that assigns women and men different roles with respect to necessary and surplus labor. Generally, women have greater responsibility for the ongoing tasks associated with necessary labor, and especially for work connected with children. Men, correspondingly, often have greater responsibility for the provision of material means of subsistence, a responsibility that is ordinarily accompanied by their disproportionately greater involvement in the performance of surplus labor. While women have historically had greater responsibility for the ongoing tasks of necessary labor in class societies, it is not accurate to say that there is some universal domestic sphere, separate from the world of public production. In class societies based on agriculture, feudalism, for example, the labor processes of necessary labor are frequently integrated with those of surplus production. It is the development of capitalism, as Chapter 11 shows, that creates a sharp demarcation between the arena in which surplus labor is performed and a sphere that can properly be called domestic. To the extent that analysts assert the universality of some invariant domestic sphere, they are in fact projecting onto non-capitalist class societies a distinction that is the product of capitalist relations of production. 
the exact form by which men obtain more means of subsistence than needed for their own individual consumption varies from society to society, but the arrangement is ordinarily legitimated by their domination of women and reinforced by institutionalized structures of female oppression. The ruling class, in order to stabilize the reproduction of labor power, as well as to keep the amount of necessary labor at acceptable levels, encourages male supremacy within the exploited class. Quick outlines the dynamic. Beginning of long quote. Any attempt by women to appropriate to themselves more than is required for their subsistence is an indirect demand for part of the surplus appropriated by the ruling class. Thus, male authority over women is supported and even enforced by the ruling class. On the other hand, any attempt by men to evade their, quote, responsibilities for the support of women is also resisted, within the confines of a system which relies on male supremacy. Men's control of means of subsistence greater than needed for their own reproduction on a day-to-day -day level is granted to them, in order to enable them to contribute to the reproduction of their class. End quote. Such strategies work on behalf of the dominant class, whatever the immediate advantages of male supremacy to men. It is the provision by men of means of subsistence to women during the childbearing period, and not the sex division of labor in itself, that forms the material basis for women's subordination in class society. The fact that women and men are differentially involved in the reproduction of labor power during pregnancy and lactation, and often for much longer, does not necessarily constitute a source of oppression. Divisions of labor exist in all societies. Even in the most egalitarian hunting and gathering society, a variety of tasks is accomplished every day requiring a division of labor. Differences among people arising out of biological and social development also characterize every society. Some individuals may be mentally retarded or physically handicapped. Some may be heterosexual, others homosexual. Some may marry, some may not. And of course, some may be men and others women, with the capacity to bear children. The social significance of divisions of labor and of individual differences is constructed in the context of the actual society in which they are embedded. In class societies, women's childbearing capacity creates contradictions from the point of view of the dominant class's need to appropriate surplus labor. The oppression of women in the exploited class develops in the process of the class struggle over the resolution of these contradictions. Women in the ruling class may also be subordinated to the men of their class. Where such subordination exists, it rests, ultimately, on their special role with respect to the generational replacement of individual members of the ruling class. As the socialist tradition has argued, the issue here is property. If property comes to be held by men and bequeathed to children, female oppression becomes a handy way to ensure the paternity of those children. In a particular society, shared experiences of and cultural responses to female oppression may produce a certain degree of solidarity among women across class lines. While this solidarity has a basis in reality, and can be of serious political import, the situations of women in the dominant and exploited classes are fundamentally distinct from a theoretical perspective. Only women in the subordinate class participate in the maintenance and replacement of the indispensable force that keeps a class society going, exploitable labor power. The existence of women's oppression in class societies is, it must be emphasized, a historical phenomenon. It can be analyzed, as here, with the guidance of a theoretical framework, but it is not itself deducible theoretically. Confusion as to the character of women's oppression has frequently generated an unproductive search for some ultimate theoretical cause or origin of women's oppression. Origins exist, of course, but they are historical, not theoretical. Footnote. For a discussion of the historical origins of women's oppression, see Alexander, Benaria, Caulfield, Ciancanelli, Deere, and Leon de Laal, Godelier, Middleton, Young. End footnote. 
The argument to this point may be recapitulated as follows. Human beings have the capacity to produce more use values than they need for their own immediate subsistence. In a class society, this potential is organized to the benefit of a ruling class, which appropriates the surplus labor of a subordinate class according to some determinate set of social relations. For this class society to survive, an exploitable labor force must always be available to perform surplus labor. Workers, however, do not live forever. They suffer, quote, wear and tear and death, and must be continually replaced by, at the very least, an equal amount of fresh labor power, end quote. Where replacement is through generational reproduction, the fact that human beings fall into two distinct biological groups, women and men, comes into play. Women's somewhat diminished capacity to work during the childbearing period potentially creates a contradiction for the ruling class. Out of the class struggle over resolving this contradiction, a wide variety of forms of reproduction of labor power has developed in the course of history. In virtually all cases, they entail men's greater responsibility for provision of material means of subsistence, women's greater responsibility for the ongoing tasks of necessary labor, and institutionalized forms of male domination over women. While exceptions exist, and may indeed offer important insights on the questions of reproduction of labor power in class society, the historical legacy remains one that has been characterized, for better or worse, as patriarchal. In this sense, Joan Kelly is right to point out that patriarchy is at home at home. The private family is its proper domain. End quote. In most class societies, women of the exploited class participate to some extent in surplus production as well as in necessary labor. Footnote. Similarly, men ordinarily participate to some extent in the immediate tasks of necessary labor. It is important to recognize that personal maintenance tasks, washing oneself, brushing one's teeth, and so on, constitute necessary labor, as does the work involved in getting to the site of production walking six miles to the mill, commuting to the office by train, and so on. End footnote. Their specific responsibilities and subordination in the tasks of necessary labor may carry consequences for the work they do in the area of surplus production. For instance, individual responsibility for child care in capitalist society renders women exceptionally vulnerable to the oppressive conditions of home work. Conversely, Involvement in surplus labor may affect the forms of women's necessary labor. On American plantations, for example, most slave women worked in the master's fields, while the tasks of cooking and childcare were collectively carried out by older women and very young children. At a particular juncture in the development of a given class society, the oppression of women in the exploited class is shaped not only by women's relationship to the processes of maintenance, and renewal of labor power, but by the extent and character of their participation in surplus labor. The actual working out of a specific class society's forms of reproduction of labor power is a matter for historical investigation, and in the present for political intervention as well. Certain tendencies can be deduced, however, from the theoretical framework just presented. In situations that minimize the importance of generational replacement of labor power, sex divisions of labor and family institutions in the exploited class may be relatively weak. If a ruling class relies on migrant labor from outside the society's boundaries, for example, it might house these workers in barracks, put women and men to work at similar jobs, encourage contraception or sterilization, and ignore the effects of heavy work on women in the last months of pregnancy. Ordinarily, generational replacement provides the major part of a society's need for the reproduction of labor power. Here, a severe labor shortage caused by war, famine, or natural catastrophe would tend to exaggerate the contradictory pressures on women workers. Depending on the historical situation, either the role of the family as the site of generational reproduction, or the importance of women's participation in surplus labor, or both, might be emphasized. 
during a period in which the ruling class's need to maximize surplus labor overwhelms long-range considerations. All individuals in the exploited class might be mobilized into surplus production, causing severe dislocations in its institutions of family life and male dominance. Such was the case in industrializing England during the 19th century, and such, it can be argued, is again the case in the advanced capitalist countries today. These tendencies will not proceed unopposed. Migrant workers may fight against their isolation from kin. Native-born workers may oppose the use of foreign labor. Women may refuse to stay home to bear and raise children. Men may resist the participation of women in the labor force. Workers may support legislation banning child labor. Women and men may organize to defend the existing forms of their institutions in family life. In short, the processes of the reproduction of labor power in class society ordinarily constitute an important terrain of battle. End section.